Great. Uh, so my name is Rob Emanuel. I'm the maintainer of a project called GeoTrellis. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, distributed tile processing with GeoTrellis and Spark. So first I'm gonna uh, ask a motivating question, sort of how do, we, how do we work with very large raster data? And when I say very large, I mean um, raster data that you'd need to work on a cluster with. It won't fit into uh, the memory of one machine, even a beefy machine. Um, and also, you know, if we want to do it, qu uh, process this, this data quickly. And usually with this talk, I'll, I'll mention a couple different data sets, but I'm going to specifically talk today about the uh, NASA NEXT Downsampled Climate Projections Open Data Set. Um, so how do we work with this, this data set? So what is, what is this data set that we're, that we're talking about? Um, there's these things called global circulation models, which are models of uh, worldwide temperature and precipitation. And it predicts out uh, those uh, data points over about 100 years um, to try to measure you know, what, what climate change is, uh, is, is happening. So there's an uh, organization called the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they publish a assessment report um, about every five years. That's a, sort of a scientific curation of uh, the output to these models and the data that we have available. And it's uh, collaborated on by more than 800 authors wor worldwide. Some of the best minds that are working on climate change are, are working on this, uh, on, this, on this data. And we can organize the model data into three key categories. Um, there's the different models that are run that come from uh, all over the world, different scientific inst uh, institutions. And then there's uh, model ensembling, so we take averages over the models. Uh, it outputs three different data sets. There's a temperature max, temperature min, and preci precipitation. And then there's scenarios that they run over. Uh, one set is like a historical run from 1950 uh, until 2006. And then um, there's these uh, things called RCPs, which are carbon emission scenarios that basically say, okay, how, how is carbon going to be, uh, how, how is the human race going to deal with carbon emissions over the future? Uh, for example, here's three of the four uh, RCPs that are included in the next data set. Uh, RCP, RCP 4.5 says, uh, all right, carbon emissions will peak in 2000 or 2040, uh, around 2040, 2050, and then go down to uh, lower than current levels, uh, which would be pretty awesome. And then RCP 8.5 says, we're just going to continue business as usual and uh, keep pumping carbon into the air. So the next uh, downsampled data is uh, monthly data over the United States. Uh, it's downsampled, so it's pretty high resolution um, for this type of data set. And there's four RPC scenarios uh, included from 2006 to 2099. It's available on S3 publicly uh, as uh, over 8,000 net CDF files that are about a gig or so each. Um, and we, as part of our pre-processing, we uh, export it to GeoTIFF tiles. And so I measured how, how big that was. It's 15.3 terabytes. Um, and even for one combination of one model, one data set, and then one RCP scenario, uh, like a max for one of those is like 90.92 gigabytes. So even if you're working at one with one data set across that time period, um, it's pretty, pretty large. So I'm going to talk about our workflow for working uh, with this, this data set. Some of the tools that we use, uh, like I said, I'm the maintainer of GeoTrellis. What GeoTrellis is, is it's a Scala library for doing uh, basically anything geospatial. We have uh, library functionality for doing uh, vector processing, uh, reprojection, uh, geojson stuff. But our main focus has been on raster processing, uh, doing really, really fast and optimized um, single tile, just like single threaded chunking through raster data and doing complex geospatial operations on raster data. And then uh, it's also a framework for doing distributed raster processing over tiled rasters. Uh, we have cap uh, our main framework that we've had historically is based on ACA and works really well for if you can fit like a raster in a single machine and it has a bunch of cores and it can paralyze over that tiled raster data um, on a single machine. But most of our current development is focused on um, integrating with Spark. And I'll s explain what Spark is later. Uh, and we have, uh, for people who know what math algebra terms are, we have uh, all these local, zonal, focal, and global operations uh, implemented on raster. And we're currently at incubation at Location Tech. So for those of you who don't know what Spark is, uh, it's fast and it's a really fast uh, cluster compute engine. Um, it's could, could be described as like a next generation 
Hadoop uh, structure. If you do sort of like larger data processing and you don't know what Spark is, then get on the ball. Uh, it's it's really it's uh, really gaining steam these days. Uh, it's written in Scala, which is nice for us because we integrate really well with it. Uh, but it also has uh, bindings for Python and Java. And for our back end, we use Accumulo, which is a um, big table implementation on top of HDFS. So we use, uh, use that to store our tiles and do um, some indexing. Uh, Accumulo gives us really good precision about where we want to store tiles and be able to do range queries on how to uh, get tiles out of our store. Uh, and another great point about Cumulo is that um, it's used by GeoMesa, another location tech project that Andrew had mentioned, uh, which is a Scala project, and we hope to uh, be collaborating with them in the future even more. Uh, so what are some strategies working with these big rasters? Uh, one thing is to just tile the raster. So if you have a very giant raster, you just uh, break it up into the individual tiles and work on the individual tiles. That's one strategy. Uh, so those are spatial tiles, but th you could also have spatial temporal tiles where you would look at the tiles as sort of a, uh, uh, a stack of tiles in three dimensions, with third dimension being time. And then you uh, can index these tiles, sort of project the two-dimensional or three-dimensional index schemes onto uh, a single dimension uh, using a z what's called a z-curve, uh, or geohashing in the 2D sense. Um, on the left, we have the two-dimensional z-curve that uh, allows us to index the tiles in that way, and then uh, the harder to look at uh, three-dimensional z-curve. And uh, the z-curves are nice because they allow us to do range queries uh, uh, of continuous um, spaces in the three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space and not have to uh, query individual tile IDs. Uh, we can actually turn them into a set of uh, ranges in the z-space. And so Spark uh, provides this um, idea called a, a resilient distributed data set. That's sort of the core data type in Spark. And it allows you to look at a, um, a large data set across a cluster as sort of a single collection. It lets you do functional transformations on that uh, RDD. So what we provide to Spark is a raster RDD. And that uh, a raster RDDK, where the key, uh, the key type is, is generic and based on the tiling, so, uh, the indexing. So we, ha we support uh, spatial-only tile uh, rasters uh, or rasters with um, a spatio-temporal key for the easier to say space-time key. Uh, so the first thing we have to do to get the, this uh, next data set uh, into GeoTrellis is to do some data loading. Um, so first off, NetCDF is sort of a, uh, tough to work with because it's just all packed into um, these large files. Uh, so the first step I did was just use some uh, Rasterio Python code um, to tie to take the NetCDF uh, format and then tile each uh, of the bands of that uh, raster into 512 by 512 GeoTIFF tiles. And that's a really uh, embarrassingly parallel problem. You can kind of just fire up some uh, EC2 instances that read from a, a simple queue service uh, that takes the NetCDF file, downloads it, chunks it out, and then throws it into another S3 bucket. So we don't really need um, complex indexing for that sort of uh, that sort of step. So uh, the code's on my GitHub if you want to take a look at that um, that code. And the next step is to ingest the data into uh, Cumulo using GeoTrail Spark. So that process is um, a little more complicated because we are indexing the tiles. Uh, we actually take the GeoTIFFs off of S3, reproject them into Web Mercator because we want to view them on a map. Uh, we mosaic the tiles into a uh, TMS tiling scheme, so we determine what a zoom level, what zoom level should fit to, and then take the tiles and kind of make um, the web tiles out of the, the tiles that are incoming. And then we can pyramid up the zoom levels and calculate the index splits to give to accumulate so that the, it stores them very efficiently. And what we end up with, uh, I wrote a little catalog viewer uh, that looks like this. Um, you can see that I have uh, CCSM4 is a, uh, a model type, and RCP45 is the carbon emission scenario where there's uh, we curb carbon emissions uh, in the future. And we can see we have a number of zoom levels and the dates uh, for each of the months for just uh, just four years. We can go ahead and take a look at that on a map. Um, and then here's RCP85, which is carbon emissions that are 
um, actually a lot higher. And you can see that there's, the bluer is, is colder, so uh, you can see that the RCP85 is less cold. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, in 2060, in August, what that looks like. The RCP45, there, in this case, the, the more red, the more hot it is. Um, it looks like this, and then the RCP85 with the higher carbon emissions, you see a lot more red. So this should be enough to convince you to curb your carbon emissions. I mean, do you want to live in this world or this world? So, uh, all right. So now I want to do some live coding with GeoTrails just to show, show uh, what, what it sort of looks like to work with this data, not on a map, but actually in a, in a console. Um, Right, so this is all in Scala, so uh, apologies if you aren't familiar with Scala, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to follow along. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just do some, some imports of uh, some of the functionality, the, uh, the raster package for GeoTrellis, the vector package, and the Spark. Uh, import a Cumulo, and uh, I need a password token. Um, and then make this Spark context implicitly available. So first thing we're going to do is connect to a Cumulo. And we see some Zookeeper output. Zookeeper kind of keeps track of, of what Accumula is doing. Uh, so now we're connected, and there's a catalog attached to the Accumula instance, Accumula.catalog. And in uh, GeoTrellis, the idea of a catalog is just what you load data out of or save data into. So I can start um, loading data out of this by doing catalog.load. I have to strongly type the... Um, the key type so that uh, I get an RDD that's uh, actually typed on the space time key. And then uh, what was that model name? CCSM 4 RCP 45. And let's work with zoom level 5. And oh, you know what? I need to put in the layer ID class. Uh, and that's it. Great. So we can do the same thing with. RCP85, and now we have these raster RDDs that represent all of the tiles for that data set. And uh, if I import some uh, operations here, like local uh, raster operations, I can do things like take a difference of those two rasters. So I take RCP85 minus RCP45. Great, so now th this gives me a raster RDD that represents the work that'll give the difference between the two rasters. Uh, it hasn't actually done anything yet because I haven't asked it for any results. But let's do something easy and, qu and take the min and the max of that raster. You'll see that Spark kicks off, and, uh, and I get some results. Uh, and we see that it's negative 14 and 18. So this would mean that um, in some of the cases, the RCP45, the lower carbon emission scenario, uh, it has cells that are warmer than the corresponding um, raster that's uh, the RCP85, which shouldn't be surprising just because they're different model calculations. But what what would be surprising if there were more warmer cells in RCP45 than RCP85, right? Because we're kind of expecting the more carbon in the air, the, hot, the, the hotter it's going to get. So that I'm currently working on my local machine is like 30, 30 gigs, I think. What's that? Uh, one band, it's a, it's like a s each band, so one month's data over um, is a set of tiles. Each of the tiles are 512 by 512, but the total uh, area of the United States, I think, is like 7,000 by 5,000, roughly. Uh, great, so what I can do here is just do some like functional calculation on the difference to say uh, if I take a local, local if operation, which takes... Um, a function that says for each value, le, uh, if the value is data, we want to ignore no data values, and uh, it's above zero, which means that the RCP85 is actually warmer, then assign it one, or else assign it zero, right? And I can kind of store that off temporarily. Great. Live coding. Great, uh, and then so now I have an another R raster RDD where ev all the tiles are either transformed to one or zero be based off of if it's uh, warmer or colder. Uh, so what I can do with this, I can map into the tiles, do it a little tuple unpacking, and then take the tile, and all I want to do with the tiles is uh, do two array double and take the sum of it. 
So now this gives me a RDD of doubles that are just represent the sums of each of the tiles, and then I could just do a sum of um, that RDD to get the total sum, and you'll see that Spark kicks off and actually calculates all of that stuff. Uh, so we get the hotter value, uh, the hotter cell values is that number, and then I'll just cheat and take the colder values, and we get another number. And if everything works out, then hotter minus colder should be a large number. So there are a lot more hotter cells in the RCP85 scenario than the uh, RCP45 scenario. Yeah, yeah, this is all local. Yeah, so Spark does like some spillover stuff. So it just loads different partitions of the tiles, works on them, and then f throws the, the it like it's, it does all the memory management for me, which is really key because I don't. <laughs> that's a that's a tough problem that they solve. That's the I don't want to have to solve that. Uh, all right, another thing that we could do is actually uh, save off a raster. So instead of looking at just the difference with the negative values, I want to look at the absolute difference between the values. So I can use uh, a local. Absolution, uh, absolute value function, which takes the absolute value of each cell, and then I could do something like catalog dot save, uh, call it, give it a new layer ID, call it diff. It's at zoom level five. I'm going to give it the um, the table to store the tiles in a cumulo, and then give it uh, abs diff. Boom. Uh, so this is actually chunking through some data. Let's see if I did this right, and you should be able to see. Yeah, see, this is the Spark UI, and you see it actually saving off the, the value. And so this, this is the 36.1 gigabytes is where, like how big the RDD is. Uh, and then right now, it's also calculating a histogram for the whole entire raster, because the histograms are really useful for um, visualizing. So it just uh, calculates the histogram and saves that off into metadata. And so now, if I restart my service, Boom. Uh, we should be picking up that new uh, layer and be able to look at it, which we can. Awesome. All right, so I colored this a little differently just because uh, this is easier. The lighter green is lower values, and the higher green is uh, uh, larger differences. And you can see I didn't do any pyramiding to this raster layer, so it's only at zoom level 5. Uh, so if I try to zoom out, it'll pop off. Great. Um, how much time do I have left? About. Was that 10, 5 minutes? OK, great. Let's try to go through this part of it. Um, so I might want to do something a little more complicated. Say I want to find the tile in the difference, uh, the absolute difference that has the most variance, so the, the, the greatest total difference. Um, for that, I'm going to do um, sort of a, the sum calculation again, but I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take, I'm going to map over the tile, and, uh, tile ID and tile again. Uh, take the sum, but keep the tile ID and tile sum uh, data because I'm going to actually look at that later. Oops. So let me just paste that in instead of typing all that out. Great. And then what I could do now is I can take that's called diff sums. And then I can do the Spark uh, RDD max operation, but I need to give it an ordering because it doesn't know how to order um, that. Uh, that this uh, tuple type. So I do the tuple unpacking again. So this is the ID. Uh, we have the tile and the sum. And then I'm going to say just order it by the sum. And that's it. Sweet. Thank you. Yep. Boom. Uh, and then so this is, uh, this should be the uh, tile ID, or like let's call it key, the tile, and the sum. So Spark kicks off, does the does the max operation. It does the map and the max operation. So I get the sum and I get the tile, oops, tile and I get the key. Um, so if we look at that, the key says it's uh, 2058 uh, 03, so March of 2058. We can go ahead and take a look at that. 2058 03, boom. And you can see that here's a pretty large difference. So I can kind of guess where the tile would be. But instead of that, I'm going to actually put it on the map. Uh, and this will show some uh, vector um, capabilities of GeoTrellis. Uh, first of all, I'm going to import some stuff to work with vectors. Um, doo -doo -doo, sorry. 
Great. So I'm importing the reprojection logic, uh, the, the GeoJSON logic, and then also Proj4 so I can specifically name um, these, uh, uh, the, the CRSs. I have a utility function, just write JSON to a file that'll paint it on the map if it's, if it's there. Um, so the, f oops. So yeah, so I wanna find the extent of that key. And if we look at the key, it gives me the daytime, but it also gives me this like tile coordinate for the key. So we have some metadata that can allow you to turn that into a, in a map extent. Uh, and that'll be in Web Mercator, so I'll call it Web Mercator Extent. Um, and then so what it be diff dot metadata uh, dot map transform transform the uh, key. So we should get a web mercator extent, but I actually want the uh, it in lat long. So I do wm extent uh, dot reproject from web mercator to lat long. Great. So now I can just write uh, that JSON out just turn it to a polygon, and then to GeoJSON. And now that should actually show up on my map if I did all the things correctly. Yep. So now we get the extent of the tile in lat long that we can put through a web service and just paint on a, on a leaflet map. Um, I think that's all the code I wanted to show you. There's some more stuff about calculating isochromes, but I don't really have time for, time for that. So. Thanks. Um, <laughs> live coding. Whew. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Johan. He's going to talk about um, the reader that we use to read those geotiffs that we put into S3 from the NetCF files.